Okay, here we are in Northern Baja, Mexico. Welcome to another episode of Crime Pays with Bad and He Doesn't. We're here basically to sort of tail end of the Southern California Floristic Province. You know where it turns into that. The coastal chaparral turns into the giant cactus deserts further south. But we still got quite a bit of uh, Quercus agrifolia here, Coast Live Oak. You got the granitic boulders. Uh, you got all kinds of interesting stuff. But over here we got a... A new species of uh, what looks like a turkey tail, but is actually in a different genus over here, decomposing this oak log, turning it into soil. Alan, what's going on? So this is what they call a false turkey tail. And you can tell the difference, because if you flip it over, it's orange on the underside, and it has no pores. Even with a microscope, you can't see any trace of pore. Whereas with a real turkey tail, you'll have it'll be white, and there'll be lots of little pores that are round and just packed with pores. So this one is Sterium herzutum, at least that's what we call it. But the real Sterium herzutum was described from Germany or somewhere in Europe. And the DNA sequence between this and the real one is quite a bit different. This thing is super common. It's on like every log in California. So it's one of the most common fungi in the California floristic province, but it still doesn't have a scientific name. So it, it seems like there's been a running theme here where a lot of mushrooms uh, were assumed to be European ones. Uh, people just weren't taking into account that 3,000 miles of ocean is a good barrier between two different populations. And so the ones on the west side of the Atlantic might, might just be new species, huh? Yeah, well, when they were describing all these fungi from North America, they would try to make sure they didn't describe them from North America, the same one from Europe. So if they could find a European name for it, they would use it and not publish it as new. But it turns out that most of the European names don't apply in North America. A few of them do. But for the most part, they don't. So a lot of our stuff is different than European stuff. And that leaves us with a lot of mushrooms that don't have names. And that's because these ecosystems, both in North America and Europe, have quite likely been separated for millions of years. Yeah. And so anyway, so, okay, so this one, you said it's got a, it's got a taste to it. What would it taste like? And then it turned red. The show us that. So this one is turning red a little bit where it's damaged. So here you can see I kind of bit into it and damaged the side there. And there's just a little little bit of like, almost like a wine, uh, kind of wine-ish, wine-colored red there. So a lot of Sterium species do that, but the ones that are famous for it are like Sterium gossipatum or Sterium sanguinolentum. They turn like blood red when you touch them, but that's that's a pretty good amount of red color right there. And so that's just the oxidation of some sort of secondary metabolite within the tissue of this basidial carp. Yeah, it's something going on chemically, and you know, when you damage and break the cells, then... Uh, then you get that. What they're doing here, they're just turning this log into soil, basically. Yeah, exactly. And this fungus is extremely successful. It's like everywhere. And when it dries out, you know, it looks pretty similar. These are nice and fresh, you know, all pliable and everything. But when it dries out, it's not a whole lot different, just a little bit more bleached out. And it'll stay on this log for, you know, a year or two, even when it's totally dry. Do you find it on other species or just on uh, Quercus agrifolia, Coast Live Oak? Any oak, um, it'll, it'll grow on. I don't see it on Kana for much. But yeah, what's this? This, this is a rusula. This is huh? an old rusula. Would have been in good shape last week. Probably in the rusula brevipes group, but if it's spicy, then it's not. And this one, um, you know, it's really too old to taste to find out. Oh, God, I could smell it. So taste, yeah, is, a, taste is an important diagnostic factor for a lot of these mushrooms. You, yeah, you, the smell is the bacteria. Right, that smells the bacteria, but when you're tasting them, you're detecting different chemical. Yeah, the sesquiterpenes are really peppery. But these are mycorrhizal, so it's impossible to cultivate. But you can spread the spores around and cultivate them in like a wild fashion. Are they edible? Is it good or something? Oh, look at that. Is it good to eat or something? They're not bad, mm -hmm. if it's not spicy. Sesquiterpene lactones, Asteraceae has those. Look at this guy over here, another beautiful species of sumac, Rus integrifolia. But the name can be misleading because those leaf margins sometimes don't have uh, teeth on them. Those beautiful flowers. Look, a, a triffid stigma, five petals, and plenty of nectar in there. So I'm looking at these flowers. You can see, look, look, you can barely see the stamens. They're in there, those little brown dots in the middle of that flower surrounding that yellow nectary, which is still glistening with the nectar. You got that triffid stigma, which is part of the gynoecium, the uh, female part of the flower. You can see the, the pink ovary is uh, beneath it but you can see those stamens they like, look somewhat reduced they're not going to really be able to come in contact with any bee you know they're they're kind of you know alternating with the petals in there 
stuck inside the flower. How do you know how does shit is that gonna work? They don't look juicy, they don't look plump. They're they're not putting out pollen now, they're not yellow. So, you know, it makes me think either this is a protandrous plant that is it's male first, then female, it breaks its sexual stages up into two, you know, to promote outcrossing, all right? So you don't get those re recessive alleles, you know, from inbreeding, you know, like the, the Spanish dynasty was doing fucking 500 years ago. But uh, turns out these plants are partially dioecious. So you'll have, you'll have perfect flowers or you'll have unisexual flowers. Most flowering plants... Like, I think like 80 to 90% of them have perfect flowers, bisexual flowers. They got an androecium, the male parts, and a gynoecium on the same flower, the female parts. But, uh, of course, many will break it up. Cannabis is a great example. I always use that. Everybody knows cannabis. All right, cannabis is dioecious, all right, unisexual plants. Not just unisexual flowers, but unisexual plants. If the, the You know, some plants can have unisexual flowers, but both on the same. Anyway, the point of this is you got to look at flowers, all right? They're all fucking puzzles. There's some really interesting shit going on there. They're breaking up their sexual cycles to promote outcrossing. Uh, sometimes you'll see the, uh, the gynoecium, the style part of the gynoecium, drastically elongated compared to the male, the male parts, etc. So you always got to look closer at what's going on here. There's some really interesting shit. And so I just learned something new about this. Every flower is a puzzle. What pollinates it? How does it promote outcrossing? Uh, what's, it, what's it doing in there, you know? Really take it apart. Identify the gynoecium, androecium, nectaries, etc. From the same family, we have this plant over there, which is a definite no-no plant. That's poison oak, okay? Toxicodendron diversilobum, all right? And you always meet that one wise ass who says, no, I'm not allergic to it. No, buddy, you just haven't been sensitized yet, all right? I think 90% of the population is allergic or will become allergic to Eurasia, which, again, one-third of the plants in Anacardiaceae, the family that both these plants are in, one third of the plants produces Eurasiol in that family. All right, I, you know, probably antifungal or the discourages herbivory, whatever. But either way, there you go. Anyway, Rus integrifolia, all right, which produces you know wonderful uh, edible fruits, and then a Toxicodendron diversilobum, the poison oak. Ah, look what Alan just brought me. There you go, a functionally male, a functionally staminate flower the reverse of what we see over here which is a, a functionally female flower with reduced stamens over here we got uh the stamens prominent with a reduced ovary and style and stigma i don't see a style and stigma in there to you maybe there at the base somewhat reduced you could see that that little triffid stigma in there but it doesn't look juicy it's probably not even fertile but those stamens are definitely juicy and fertile and plump and putting out pollen on those anthers that's pretty remarkable, man. I didn't know that about that. I'm going to start paying attention to this trait in many more roos species, many more sumac species that I see. Okay, so what's, yeah, what's here? Show, show us this. What's going on? So here we have Amanita ocreata, and it is a deadly poisonous mushroom, one of the few deadly mushrooms that's out here. So this Amanita grows mycorrhizal with coast live oak, and it has a white cap. And this one has a little bit of what they call a sunburst pattern, which is a little bit of reddish color towards the inside of the cap. And the cap has a solid margin. So the edible Amanitas, a lot of them have the striate margin, and this margin is completely solid. But to really know for sure what this is, we're going to have to very carefully dig up the stem base. If I just grab this and pull it out, the stem base is going to break off in there because Amanita ocreata has a bulbous stem base. So we kind of have to dig under it and pop it out from below. And it just broke, but yeah, here's a stem base here. And you can see that it is relatively bulbous. Looks like it was flattened against the rock there, but it's expanding. So Amanita ocreata, it's got free gill attachment and it's uh, got amatoxins in it. So if you eat it, nothing happens for about 12 hours, but it stops the protein synthesis. So your body can't make any new proteins because it gums up the ribosomes. So you get real sick in about 12 hours and you die in a week. Oh, wow. Okay. Now they can save your life with a liver transplant, but a new liver is $800,000 $800, with installation. And it's mycorrhizal with the uh, with the Quercus agrifolia. Yep. Joe, what's the what's what's this? You, what you get here? What's this? So stuff? here we have another poisonous mushroom. This one is Omphalotus olivacens. The common name is jack o' lantern. This is a woodlubber, so it's probably growing on a buried tree root or some kind of branch or stick that's down there. 
but this one is not deadly. If you eat it, you'll just throw up um, really violently for a couple days, but then you'll be fine. This Ooh. one's really cool though, because it's bioluminescent, so it glows in the dark. It's glowing right now, it's just uh, really dim. So this is glowing right now, but if you, so you'd have to put like a whole drape of black velvet above it with the little cage and then you could see it glowing. It'd have to be really opaque. Oh cool, it's growing right off of this stick here. Oh, look at that, that's, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, that's really nice. That's like a specimen for the fungus fair. Yeah. You could put that on the table at the fungus fair. Yeah, so this one's got decurrent gills that run down the stem and it's got white spores. So you can see there's like a little bit of a white bloom on the gills there and that's all the white spores that are forming. And this one has a lot of color in it, so it's often used to make watercolor paints or to stain fabric. And um, it's often mistaken for chanterelles because it's kind of orange and gills run down the stem. But it doesn't really look much like a chanterelle if you look closely at it. Yeah, it looks a little bit different. And wouldn't chanterelles, the gills would go all the way down a stem, wouldn't they? A little more, and the gills are a lot thicker. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this one's olivescent for the olive color. And it definitely oh. always has this kind of olive color here. Also, often mistaken for gymnopilus. But we, to be clear, we're talking about pizza olives, not the green olives. Like you might take from the salad bar, you know, help yourself at Berkeley Bowl or something. It looks a little bit greenish to me. And they get this color more when it ages. So it starts out just orange, and then when it's like really old, um, it'll be more of this dark color. Oh, it actually smells kind of good. It doesn't smell nauseating. I like it. Yellow, you think? It might change yellow. We gotta see. So now we got Sergio's gonna put some KOH, some potassium hydroxide on this as a, as a test, oh, a yeah. diagnostic yeah. test on this Amanita. Yeah, see, look at it turn that yellow. So, Alan, what's that tell us? What's that tell us, guys? Well, one difference between Amanita phylloides and Amanita ocreata is that Amanita phylloides does not turn yellow in KOH. But there's actually a few species that are going under the name Amanita ocreata, and some of them don't turn yellow in KOH. So this tells us it's the real ocreata, or at least in the clade with the real ocreata. So basically just another chemical test. Yeah. Presence of certain chemicals. Look at it. What's this stuff? Like every time I come ask you about something, I take on the persona of like a... 55 year old west side italian smug brick what's this stuff no seriously on the why don't you tell us about what's going on here so here we got a gallerina and we can tell it's gallerina because it's got an orange spore print we're thinking it looks a lot like deconica because the gills are just a little bit decurrent but if you look see we have a couple growing right next to each other and if you just kind of move this one over you see the spore print on there and it's definitely dropping orange spores the other thing that tells us this gallerina is the stem texture if you look at the stem, it's kind of got this flaccos mycelium towards the base. So this is probably one of the non-toxic gallerina, because gallerina have a reputation for being deadly, but that's really just the gallerina marginata group. These other gallerinas that are not closely related to it tend to be non-toxic, most likely. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the genus gallerina is very ecologically important in its role as serving as a wood decomposer within uh, the ecosystems. And these can be found all over the planet. I mean, what continents are gallerina restricted to, or are they pretty... Gallerina is everywhere. They're everywhere. We're seeing yeah. them all okay. over New Zealand, mm -hmm. South America. Um, Marginata was described from Europe. And so for any viewers in the audience, what Alan's doing is he uses a, a variety of different characters in the form of, uh, you know, a, a chemical tests with things like KOH, uh, paying attention to spore color, as well as diagnostic traits about the morphology of the mushroom to determine what he's looking at. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'm trying to set them up here so you can have like one photo that shows all the different features. So we got young ones, we got old ones, we got the top, we got the underside. This one shows the decurrent gills pretty well, just starting to run down the stem. Mm -hmm. So decurrent gills as opposed to what would be the... Either like free is the most opposite of that because mm -hmm. free gills never touch the stem at all. That's what you see. In they just arch back up towards the underside of the cap. Yeah, they arch back up before they hit the stem. Uh, so that's what you see in like Amanita. Uh, usually they're just attached or notched. So they touch the stem, but they don't like run down it like this. If I were to speak in this kind of voice for the rest of my life, would you? how long would it take before you kicked me in the groin? I think you could get away with it, but most people would not be able yeah, to. Yeah, okay, wow, okay, wow, that's nice. Cardamine, Californica, nice little brassica, nice little mustard. Note that Synapomorphies are a mustard family, four petals, six stamens, distinct anther shape, and a fruit. 
that just looks like a little rod. It's a salik. Not always on brassicas. It can have multiple different kinds of fruits. But oh, what happened here? It just looks like the leaves just died. We made it a little farther up the canyon, and we got what's this? We got another mycorrhizal mushroom. Yeah, this is Lactarius rufulus. Lactarius rufulus is the Southern California version of a candy cap. So this one looks similar to a candy cap. It's Lactarius rufulus that we get further north, but this one has more of a brick red color, and it has a thicker cap and stem, and it'll have orange rhizomorphs at the stem base. What's the one you get further north? Lactarius rufulus is the candy cap that has the really strong odor. But these are... So these are edible. These are edible. Oh, oh this one's emerging leaves, too. Those little white knobs, those emerging leaves that is the dryopteris. Oh, yeah. So this one, if we break the gills here, we'll get some latex. And the latex in these species looks sort of like skim milk. Looks like it's really scant in this one. You're not getting too much latex. Let me try this one, too. Um, but it looks like skim milk. Most lactarius, the latex looks more like heavy whipping cream. But yeah, we're not even seeing it all here. Are these, are these, they're edible, but are they pretty good or what? They're edible. They have an interesting smell. It's a sweet smell. They smell just like the candy caps from up north. Yeah, pretty strong sweet smell. But when they draw, you don't get the maple syrup odor that you get from the candy caps. So they're not the really, the name is kind of a misnomer. Yeah. A Claytonia down there. You got the, I see Leptosini, Maritima, formerly Coreopsis. Wait, where'd you see Artemisia? Oh, you got sticky monkey flower down there too. Sticky monkey flower. And right here we got Romnia colteri, the Modalia poppy, the scrambled egg flower. Those glaucous blue stems. Great plant, super adapted to the uh, long dry summers. You can actually see this popping up in, in you know, fucking strip mall landscaping in some places, which is actually impressive. I'll give it to the I'll give it to them. That's a plant that belongs there, you know. I mean, strip malls shouldn't really exist, but uh, you know, that said, look at it, you got Salvia apiana over there. Oh, that's nice. Salvia apiana, heteromeles or butifolia, and uh Hespero yucco whiplii, those stalks up there. You can see it just it starts to dry out when you just a typical this great example of typical Southern California floristic province. Coastal chap chaparral, coastal sage scrub. There's that Hespero yuck over there. See them? There you go, you frilly bastard. Leptosini maritima. Not to be confused with Leptosini gigante, which is a real weird looking Dr. Seuss ass plant. So you get uh, in, I think, one or two places in coastal central California and then off on the islands as well. But formerly in the genus Coriopsis, you can see it's got those colliculi subtending this. Uh, this capitate flower head that hasn't opened up yet, this capitulum. Big yellow daisy looking flower when it does open. Ah, oh, it's a nice little waterfall. Ah, shit tons of poison oak down there and a big mat of selaginella over there. One of my favorite lycophytes. Big Dudley is over there too, look at those guys. Safe from poachers, hopefully. Did they stop poaching these, I think? Did they just take it easy a little bit? They're so fucking easy to grow from seeds. It's kind of shit for brain to, to poach them. Especially when it's it's super hot now, too, thank God. You can't get away with that no more. You can't, you know, come over here, fly over from China, load up a van with 20,000 Dudleys, and I'm sure people still try, but... You know, I don't, this is not granite. This has got a little slightly smaller grain size. I wonder if it's diorite. Who knows? Smaller grain size than that than granite. They're not that big, not that big chunks we're used to. Big mineral chunks. This is nice. So now we're a little bit higher, more sun, we're out of that canyon, and we see our old friend Ornithostaphylos opposite of folia. Except right here, you're not getting so much of the opposite leaf, then you get more of a whorl of, of uh, three branches. This is such a great plant. This splaying the phyllotaxy and the uh the, the leaf arrangement and the leaf shape, the leaf morphology of plants in a Mediterranean climate, okay? Where you get, you know, you get the winter rains and the summer dry. South Africa, Chile, Western Australia, the Mediterranean, and California. The five Mediterranean climates in the world. You can see you got all that uh, white waxy underside, that abaxial surface. Glabrous up top. Ooh, very shiny, actually. And uh, very elongated, narrow leaves because it gets quite dry here. In the summer, the, the summer is the, the hottest season is also the driest. 
Look at that. But then you, of course, still have the temperate, relatively, you know, mild temperate winters. So, you know, this is just a sprout coming up from a stump. They obviously, you know, they get really big. One of my favorite trees. You can see there's one right there. Holy shit. It's in flower, too. I've just never seen that, uh, never seen one of those sprouts looking like that. Very, very, just shooting straight up, reaching for the sun. Oh, so what here? So this is, you thought this was an Amanita at first, but it turns out it's something else. Yeah, it looks just like an Amanita, but it's Leuco agaricus aminatoides. So it's a rare species, it's more common in the south here. And the thing that tipped me off is the ring. Um, the ring is just kind of this Leuco agaricus style ring that's like tightly adhering to the stem. And it's not like the pendant annulus of an Amanita. But if this was Amanita, it'd be one of the deadly ones because it's white on the cap and pure white. But uh, this is actually edible. It's got those nice rhizomorphs in there. Yeah, it's got some rhizomorphic mycelium here in the stem base. So no annulus? Or is there an annulus? There's a little bit of an annulus. See that one there? Oh, a little remnant. Yeah, yeah it's kind of tightly go. adhering. And when it's younger, the annulus like flares upward a little bit. And Amanita annulus will never flare upwards. So that's that's mainly what's telling you this is not an Amanita. Yeah, I mean, it looked a little sketchy at first. I was kind of like, well, maybe it's Amanita sponsus or Ocreata, but it doesn't quite match any of them. You can also see that annulus there. And also, it's, there's nothing for it to really be mycorrhizal with here. There's no oaks close by. You know, there's no, we don't see, I mean, it's, it, Amanita mycorrhizal, there doesn't seem to be a host for it. Yeah, the Luca agaricus are completely saprotrophic. What do you got over here? What what what's 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 this? Oh wow! Look at that color, and a, that's a nice blue. Yeah, there's not many, not too many blue mushrooms out here. So it's an Entoloma from subgenus Cyanula, and Entoloma is a huge genus, but it's got pink spores. You can see the gills are turning pink on the old one, and then there's a pink spore print on the top of the cap of this one. This Cyanula has kind of like a brown cap color and steel blue stem these things have really cool angular spores and what's the ecology here saprotroph or yeah what? they're saprotroph we're not under any mycorrhizal species here coming up and what's this a dryopteris yeah oh look it's a phytoleca i wonder if that's a no that's not, i don't think that's the invasive one but this one certainly is an invasive species this is a nicotiana glaca the tree tobacco which is a true tobacco. It's got nicotine in there, but it's also got quite a few uh, very toxic in small doses alkaloids as well. See, it looks like it's adapting to hummer pollination, possibly moth pollination, I guess, too. Got an elongated tube. A corolla that's fusing to an elongated tube. It looks like the old style in there. So that one got pollinated. But uh, yeah, look at how glaucous that stem is. Very blue, very, very blue. It's gonna be a really bad invasive in the Central Valley. And I'm uh, surprised it hasn't gotten too bad here, but normally, you know, for a lot of invasives to get established, you normally need, you know, disturbance, some sort of disturbance uh, event. Not all of them, but but uh, most you do. Well, this is kind of, so here we are, we're about halfway up on a shady slope. Even Jack came up, the old man came up. What do you got here? So this is a Paniolus, and you can tell it's Paniolus because it's got jet black gills here. All right. And uh, the gills have a mottled texture in there. This is one that I found uh, all about one kilometer from here a few years ago, and I sequenced it and it turned out to be in the Paniola cinctulus group. So this is an undescribed species that has psilocybin in it. This is a psilocybin mushroom. Yes. You know, aqu likely acquired through horizontal gene transfer, so huh? not, For sure. not shared ancestry. Wow. Yeah, Pineolus is way off by itself genetically. There's there's nothing close to it. That's wild. And so what's it eating here, probably? Just some dead organic material? Yeah, you know, most Pineolus grows on, like, grass or manure, so it's kind of rare to find them out away from that sort of habitat. But the last time I found this species, it was, like, right on the edge of the trail, also in the same habitat. This one has sequence matches from Arizona, so this is uh, this also occurs over there. You see what they're doing. You know what they're doing. Did you see? Just post it up. See that? They're gonna be. We're gonna be here for 20 minutes, but they're doing good stuff. They're doing a lot of good stuff over there. See that? Just photographing those little guys. That that uh, little paniolas. I realize it's Venegasia carpesioides. Little composite with almost poplar-looking leaves. 
I remember seeing that before in Ojai. Boy, that's a weird place. You can really fucking get weird in Ojai. You know, it started out as like a little hippie commune. Now you get a lot of rich people and, you know, weird sexually overcharged new age weirdos up there. Anyway, look at the, uh, look at the, uh, phyleries, of course. That's a diagnostic factor right here. You can see that hole in Boliker is weird. It's got phyleries that go up and then phyleries that kind of reflects back down. You can see they alternate. Some, some, uh, just point up like that. You got multi seared phyleries, some point up. Some reflects down. Whole thing's covered in, uh, you know, her suit little hairs. And I just, uh, otherwise, just a typical little daisy flower. But the leaves are really notable on this. I mean, let's see if they're opposite. Yeah, they're alternate. But that long ass petiole, I forgot I'd even seen this. I looked at I looked on INAT to see if I, if I had seen it before. I saw it like four years ago in Ojai. What was I doing in Ojai? I was going to look for fertile area. I wasn't going to. I wasn't doing any of that weird stuff they got going up there. I wasn't going to one of those, you know, weird yoga orgy dungeons or anything like that. Not that I'm against yoga, but you know what I'm saying. I just think there's a lot of weird shit goes on. I don't know. I fucking salt crystals, you know, tantric massage oils, you know, foot fetishes, all kind of stuff. Said this is the only ectomycorrhizal polypore. Yeah, that's Coltricia. And Coltricias always have this dark pore surface, turns jet black in KOH, and kind of a cool zonate cap on the top. That's that orbital circulation? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, there's not many mushrooms with a zonate cap. And these are really cool because they only grow where there's you know, ectomycorrhizal host plants around. So they're, they're associating with something. Yeah, I mean, it's like something is probably with whatever got, roots these are. Melosma, Melosma, Lorina, Anacardiaceae. Ornithostaphylos. Oh, there you go. I wonder if they're associated with the Ornithostaphylos. Yeah, probably. Arbutoid. Yeah. With this Arbutoid member of the blueberry family, or a case of young shit. So this is cool, because we've got two mushrooms here. One is ectomycorrhizal, almost certainly with the uh, Ornithostaphylos, though you do have Melosma lorina too, but I'm, I don't know if Anacardiaceae is ectomycorrhizal. I think it's mostly Ornithostaphylos that's, uh, that's serving as the host for this little cup fungus here, and this is a Tarzetta. And then you've also got that uh, Paniolus right there. Alan, you said that's probably an undescribed Paniolus, huh? Yeah, an undescribed Paniolus in the Synctulus group. We got one there and another over here by these spider webs. And you see it's coming out right uh, you know, from this mossy wall growing on decaying organic matter. And that's a really unusual substrate for paniolus because most paniolus grow on dung or on, in grass. So to see one kind of out here in the chaparral habitat, far away from any human disturbance, is really rare. And so this is that psilocybin-containing paniolus, correct? Yeah, this is a sister species that's paniolus cinctulus. So everything in that clade contains psilocybin. And you were saying something about mottled gills, huh? Yeah. Um, we can try... You see the gills are charcoal color, charcoal black, so that indicates this has jet black spores, so that separates it from the other paniolus, like Phonosecchiae, with brown spores. And the gills have a mottled texture in it. So there's some, uh, some of the spores mature before the others, and so the, some of the parts of the gills are jet black, because they have a lot of mature spores, and other parts of the gills are like a little bit more lighter, light in color. And the mycologists call this feature inaqui hymeniferous. Inaqui hymeniferous. Yep. Where's that one? Where's that other guy over there? Oh, he's right there. Yeah. Yep. So a little bit older one here. This one has, you know, it's, it's really mature. It's got like real, really jet black gills because it's full of mature spores. And then, and then that little that tarzetta is just that's an ascomycete, so that's just putting spores out on little stalks inside that cup, huh? Yeah, it makes the spores on the ASCII, the haminophore, and an ascomycete is the inside of the cup. So it's got millions of little ASCII in there, and then they shoot out spores when they're disturbed. A thicket of Renithostaphylos. Oh, you got Aesculus peria here too, dwarf buckeye. Look at that massive burl. Nice illustration of that massive burl. On the Ornithostaphylos, the manzanita relative, creating a rich layer of duff all over the ground. And then we got a Lactarius over here too, another ectomycorrhizal mushroom, man. This, this uh, <laughs> Ornithostaphylos is really the key component of the, uh, the fungal mycorrhizal ecosystem here. Ah, that's beautiful. That's really nice. You get that, uh, you get that circular pattern on the top? No.
There's a Rusula here too, another ectomycorrhizal guy associating with ornithostaphylus. That's the only thing it could be associating with. Otherwise, you'd just see a note this. Uh, Ceanothus and then Anacardiaceae and then there's no <laughs> That's wild. What a, this makes this plant all the more ecologically important the Baja bird bush. God. I fucking love you mm. Oh, oh, yeah, I love it. God damn. Oh, you said you're so you're so nice. You're so fucking Oh Keystone species right here. Ernesto Staphylos who knew all right base of the fungal ecosystem here at least for all the ectomycorrhizal species Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Have a great day. Go fuck yourself. Bye